Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to our AI in Power Systems Symposium. Pretty happy that uh, yeah we got a decent audience compared to uh, our events normally. Okay, um, this event is actually brought to us by us, IEEE, yeah, to you, IEEE Student Branch, um, PS Chapter, and the Yera. We are teaming up uh, with our master students because uh, we think it's really important to have a connection between PhD students and master students. And we will start uh, 10 minutes with an introduction from us at the British Student Branch 11 PS chapter and then Yera. And it was, yeah, it's a pretty interesting journey. We started uh, that uh, it was me, Chandra and Mo, three people. And now you see that uh, we got some more volunteers. Pretty happy that, uh, yeah, our events are getting recognized. And uh, our vision here is just essentially to, um, yeah, we want to foster innovation to try to bridge the gap between new students or early career professionals and the industry. And uh, in order to do that, we organized uh, some events. We had uh, some in industry workshops. We had uh, some technical workshops in which we had uh, some PhD students presenting their work and their ideas some guest lectures that, um, yeah, it was a professor, um, Professor Milano from uh, University of Dublin. And also we have symposia like these ones. In addition, we also try to organize some company visits. As you see here, you had uh, company visits from the, to the co through plant. Um, yeah, it's uh, just uh, hydro pump storage. And uh, soon there will be a visit to the Port of Antwerp, but this one is not uh, that much advertised, otherwise we get that many people. Um, we also have some social events, and uh, we support uh, IEEE Women in Engineering. We recently funded uh, a new chapter that is called the IEEE Win Women in Engineering Leuven, and I'm pretty proud that we also were the first ones organizing events with them. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side of the slide there's uh, a symposium we had, and then there was a presentation from a visiting researchers, researcher from Berkeley. So just why to collaborate with us is that because as students, we know what uh, students want, and also we give access to a um, large group of uh, young professionals that uh, they are both from PhD students, but also the industry. We have a pretty, well, pretty good connections. In numbers, it's uh, just a bit of a flex that we got the 1,600 followers on LinkedIn in less than, a, yeah, a bit more than a year. If you wanted to see the recordings of the events, we have a YouTube channel for that. And also, if you wanted to follow our events, uh, you have a website there. But also, yeah, to make it easy for you to register, we also, we are showing here that we have the AI Empower System Symposium, but there will be more to come with a sustainable, um, energy supply of the future lecture from uh, Professor Gerta de Koenig. Then we will have our um, power symposium that is actually yeah, our flagship event, 25th of April. And then another event uh, that we will host with Yera in which we have a discussion between Professor uh, Dazzler and Bellmans on the 7th of May. So I leave the floor to Yera. Hi, uh, then I'll uh, introduce Yega, which is the other uh, co-organizer of this event. Um, so as you see, Yega, the Young Energy Reviewers Association, we are, uh, this is us, this is me, I'm the president from Yega. Um, who are we? We are mostly um, master students in the Master of Energy. Um, we're actually open to all students who uh, have a keen interest in energy, um, want to learn more about this subject. Our mission is to provide uh, unbiased and reliable information about energy-related topics um, to the broader public. And we do this in uh, two important ways. Uh, the first way we do this is with events, and the second way we do this is with articles. So where IEEE mostly uh, consists out of uh, PhD students, we mostly exist out of master students. Um, first, I'll go into our events. Um, we organize approximately two events um, every uh, semester. Last semester, we did an event about um, nuclear waste disposal, where we really did a deep dive in what uh, are the practicalities about how nuclear waste disposal works. And also, we did a big uh, political debate with all the Flemish uh, parties, 
who talked about their uh, vision for the energy, energy future. Um, so this semester we do this event. We'll also do the uh, event with uh, Professor Belmans and Professor uh, Dazelier. Um, and maybe we'll do a third one, but we're not out of this yet. Uh, the second thing we do is um, articles. Articles, um, we write articles, we post them uh, on our website and we also um, publi uh, publicize them uh, at uh, the IREL, so the, um, the paper of the uh, engineers. Um, it's mostly um, volunteers who come to us who say, oh, I really want to do an article about this. Then we say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll see how we can make this work. Um, then the article gets read by us and it gets read by um, some PhD students, some, uh, some professors, and they fact check if everything in the article is correct and uh, yeah, is science-based. And then, um, yeah, then it gets published. Um, I really recommend you to check out our last two um, articles, especially the one uh, about cybersecurity is actually quite interesting. And also next week, normally, um, my article about uh, the European emission trading system will also be published on our website. So uh, be, sure to ch be sure to check that out. Um, yeah, you can contact us. Please come talk to me if you're interested in joining our organization or writing an article. Um, I don't bite if you uh, are too afraid to uh, come talk to me in person, you can also uh, mail us or find us on our uh, social media. Uh, thank you. And then uh, I think we can uh, proceed to the real events. Okay, thanks for the presentation, Robin. So as you might have seen the poster today, we have uh, three presentations, one from the industry, inside, and then two academics one, one from KU Leuven from our Prof. Hussein, and then uh, one from Georgia Tech with our Professor Pascal Van Entering, who yeah, kindly came all the way from the US just for this event. <laughs> uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, and then also, uh, th yeah, big thanks to Zachary de Greve that uh, came here from UMONS to be the moderator. And yeah, maybe I can introduce uh, Zachary. Um, he received an electrical and electronics engineering degree from Faculty of Engineering uh, in Mons in 2007 and then PhD degree from the same university. Now he's actually an uh, associate professor there with the electrical power engineering unit. He was a research fellow of the Belgian Fund for Research until 2012. And his main research interests deal with application of mach machine learning and operational research to electric power systems and energy systems more generally. He also develops an expertise in computational electromagnetics and uh, yeah, you, you might have uh, understood why he's here. He works daily with these topics. So thanks again for coming. And uh, he will be the moderator at the end for our uh, discussion panel. So if I might then pass the mic to Zachary to then introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Giacomo, and thank you again for inviting me to moderate this panel today very interesting talk. So our first speaker will be Rafael Michiels, if I'm correct, yeah, in, in the good order. Um, Rafael joined Enside in 2021 as an energy analytics consultant. So Rafael got a master degree in business engineering from University of Antwerp uh, in 2020, and also another master degree in artificial intelligence from KU Leuven in 2021. So Rafael is actively working currently on projects involving machine learning with applications in the energy domain, such as maintenance planning, dynamic research sizing, and forecasting. So Rafael, thank you for being, he from, for being here. And I guess we can start the talk. The floor is yours. So I propose maybe yeah, to have the talk first and keep your questions for the moderating session in the end, so we will have the three talks in a row. Take note of your questions, and then we'll, you will have the opportunity to ask your questions during the panel session after. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> all right, so today uh, I'll be talking a bit about interconnectors, and I'll focus a bit more on uh, some real life applications, how we can uh, use these models. Um, in real life, so first of all, I'll be introducing a bit more on uh, what interconnectors are, give a little bit more uh, context, and I'll discuss also the auction process uh, related to these uh, interconnectors. 
then I'll be uh, touching upon the um, yeah, uh, maybe I'll check here. So maybe then uh, the second part, I'll check a bit on how we are developing the interconnector flow forecasting models at Insight. And then uh, the main part of today, that's looking at three applications where we use that. Uh, the first one being uh, to define a net position in the D2CF uh, process and a capacity calculation. Uh, the second application is more related to dynamic uh, reserve sizing. And then the third one is where I would like to take the, uh, or make the link between interconnector flow forecasts and congestion management. So first of all, a little bit of introduction. So this is by the time of, of, of now already a little bit outdated, but it shows already uh, some of the interconnectors uh, within uh, Europe, Western Europe. Uh, so you can see that there are already quite some ones operational. The Viking link and the Elik link are uh, operational uh, as well uh, at this time of speaking. And uh, in the years to come, uh, much more um, interconnectors will be built and operational. Um, today I'll be looking uh, a bit more in the NEMO link, so that's an interconnector that connects Belgium to the uh, Great Britain uh, network, and there is a capacity of 1000 megawatts in both uh, directions. Yeah, all right. Uh, so, uh, how does the auction uh, process is, and how is the Nemo link operated? So, typically, um, either at the Nemo link, the interconnector between Belgium and NGB is uh, operated uh, either by a third party who is trying to make a profit, or sometimes it's also operated by a holding company that is somehow uh, related to system operations. Um, but they're uh, quite stupid. So. Um, how do they make money out of the interconnectors? So typically they are selling the capacity to transport uh, electricity on that uh, cable. Um, the auction process, uh, who is participating in that? So we have a couple of market participants there. So um, a, a big bunch of people that are uh, participating in these auctions. There are uh, people that have financial gains. So they want to basically um, take some opportunities between arbitraging and so arbitraging opportunities. So sometimes prices, they do differ between Belgium and Great Britain. And then uh, traders, uh, they want to uh, gain from that spread by buying, for example, in Belgium at a lower price and then transporting it through the Nemo flow to GB where they sell it at a higher price. So these are one part of people, of market participants active on these auctions. Um, but also transmission system operators, they do also actively participate in these markets, but that's more for system operations. Um, um, yeah, um, kind of incentives. So, for example, um, they can do counter trading. So, uh, that's basically a, a measure to push back uh, electricity back to Belgium, for example. If you take the, uh, a, a, yeah, let's say, um, situation of NGSO, that's a transmission system, so system operator of uh, Great Britain. If they don't anticipate, for example, an import on the NEMO flow, but in the end, moving closer to real time, there will be more and more import coming from all the interconnectors then they could face some local congestion, so then they participate in uh, counter trading on these uh, interconnectors as well. So the auction process, uh, so there is capacity offered to the market, people, they place their bids, typically we have long-term auctions, so they can go from uh, one month ahead until one year ahead, but then the main auction is the one in day ahead, where people uh, place their bids, and after the clearing of the day head uh, auction, we have uh, the scheduled flow. So that's already quite a good base of how the physical flow will be um, in, in real life. And the, that's the physical flow, that's the actual flow that will be realized. After the day head um, auction process, we have, uh, for the Nemo link, we have four intraday auctions. So these are auctions after the scheduled flow is already made public. Um, and here, people, market participants, they can redefine their position. Um, so the remaining capacity is still provided again to the market where people can uh, buy some additional capacity in one of the two directions of these interconnectors. And at Insight, we do make uh, predictions both in D-2 and in D-1. So that's before the scheduled flow and after the scheduled uh, flow is, is, is made available. Um, in D-2, the, uh, the situation is a little bit more complex uh, as in D-1. Uh, and here, if you are uh, interested, I refer you to the Java platform. So here you have a bit more practical details on um, the output of, of this uh, auction process. We have all the details on the market period, offered capacity, allocated capacity, uh, and the defined prices for each hour of the day. So feel free to have a look uh, at the Java platform. So uh, interconnector flow forecasting, um, I'll give a very high level description. So what we do at Insight is we try to predict the physical flow on various uh, interconnectors. 
we do that both, as I said, in D minus one and D minus two. So before and after the scheduled flow is made available. And we do have our uh, forecasting platform at Insight with also some uh, built-in uh, in-house uh, prediction algorithms. So typically a quite um, traditional setup. So we use a whole bunch of features. I try to categorize them here into uh, certain groups. We have others uh, that are not included here, but so, for example, time-related features. Here we look more in trends, seasonality effects, weather data, price forecasts as well. So these are really big drivers of interventor flow forecasts, uh, as I said, because a lot of people are taking or want to take um, um, yeah, some arbitraging opportunities uh, on these cables. Um, the forecasting platform also t uh, tackles, uh, let's say, this real-time miners. So there is a lot of things happening also in production when you try to um, use these forecasting predictions, so we have miners, we have to deal with databases, etc. Uh, and in the end, uh, the output of the forecast is consumed either uh, through an API or it can also be deployed on-premise within a secure uh, environment of system operators. So today, uh, I want to focus a bit more on the applications of um, um, these integrator flow forecasts. So the first one being in a D uh, D2CF, so that's a D-2 uh, congestion forecast. So this one, um, is used, there is a little bit of, 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 of a relation here with, with the markets uh, concept. Without going into too much detail, because it's a quite complex uh, procedure, different system operators that are part of the single day head uh, coupling mechanism, they need to share their individual grid model uh, in D minus two. So that means that in D minus two, they need to um, share their best view on in terms of load generation, flows, etc., uh, in their grid which are then aggregated into the common grid model. Um, <coughs> all this, uh, in the end, so the system operators also, also share uh, their um, non-costly remedial actions, and in the end, everything is optimized, the flow-based domain is uh, computed, and all that is used actually for the day head uh, clearing, done by Euphemia, done by another team also uh, at Endsight. Without going, as I said, in too much details of this um, in this uh, difficult and complex uh, uh, process, uh, I want to highlight a key concept, and that's the concept of the net position of a country. So the net position of a country is whether or not a, com a country will uh, import or export electricity on a certain uh, number uh, or a certain timestamp. And here we see the clear link between interconnectors. So for example, for Belgium, the NEMO flow, the interconnector, will highly impact the net position of Belgium, and thus the input provided to the whole uh, DC, uh, D2 uh, CF uh, process. So here, the interconnector forecast is really a small input in this whole big um, capacity calculation uh, procedure uh, that is done before the day head market is cleared. A second uh, application where we see um, that interconnector flow forecasts are useful is in dynamic reserve di dimensioning. So this is a project um, that we did uh, for Elias, the Belgium system operator. So I think you're all familiar with the N-1 uh, criterion. So that's the concept that says that if one element is unplanned or unexpectedly in, in, in outage, uh, that the remaining elements, let's say, in the grid should uh, remain within operational uh, security limits. So ELIA needs to be, um, has to acquire enough reserves to cover such unexpected uh, faults. And for that reason, they have reserves. So they have upward and downward reserves. So upward reserves, these are reserves that are activated when the generation is lower compared to consumption. And um, as, as an example, so I, I shared a couple of uh, the, the largest generators uh, in the Belgian uh, yeah, network uh, on the top right. So we have Dual 4, Tiange 3, and Tiange uh, 2, which are still uh, at the moment of the day uh, like the three uh, biggest uh, nuclear centrals in Belgium with a technical nominal power of 1,039 uh, megawatts. So that means that if Dual 4, for example, would be unexpectedly uh, in outage, or if the transformer, or if there are failures on the lines connecting dual four to the grid, ELA needs to be ready to cover up uh, this, this loss in generation. And for that, uh, they have upward reserves. If we look at the NEMO flow, for example, interconnector, if the NEMO flow is in import mode, that can also be seen as a kind of generation, generator. Um, so in that case, um, the NEMO flow actually will not define the upward reserves because the maximum capacity of the NEMO flow is 1,000 megawatts and the uh, maximum uh, production of dual 4 is 1,039. So here we see that on the upward reserves, we don't have a lot of uh, dynamic uh, possibilities to size our reserves, our upward reserves, because dual 4 is still large in capacity compared to the, uh, the NEMO link. 
But if we go and we, if we look at the downward reserves, there we see that an accurate forecast of the NEMO interconnector could help and assist ELIA in defining their, their downward reserves. So imagine now the situation in which we are exporting on the NEMO interconnector. That means that this, for example, let's say a full export of 1,000 uh, 1, uh, megawatts from Belgium to Great Britain. If the NEMO flow, for example, would be unexpectedly uh, in outage, that means that we, we are losing uh, this export capacity of 1,000 uh, megawatts. So then the downward reserves, they come into play and having an accurate forecast of your uh, interconnector flow does help ELIA to size their reserves dy uh, dynamically uh, related to the downward reserves. So that means that um, more downward reserves, reserves will be acquired if there is a forecast or an export uh, forecasted on the NEMO flow, whereas if we are forecasting an import, less uh, downward reserves will be uh, acquired by ELIA. And then uh, a third application uh, to close uh, the presentation for today is uh, I would like to, to take uh, or to, to map, let's say, the interconnector flow forecast with congestion management. As an example, I'll give a bit the situation uh, in Great Britain. So they have a lot of interconnectors coming from France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. If they don't anticipate the, uh, the flows correctly, then they could end up with some local congestions in their southeastern corner uh, of their grid. So let's imagine here uh, uh, a power grid. So don't have, uh, don't look too much at, at, at the legend. But so the idea is that we have some loads and some generators in a grid. And in this scenario, I will introduce some interconnectors. So the circles in red are some connection points where there is an interconnector. So that means that here there can be some import or export uh, to some neighboring country. Currently, the DACAF process, that's the day had the congestion forecast uh, process, starts around 6 uh, in the evening. And system operators typically, they provide deterministic inputs to uh, all these nodes in the grid. So that means that they try to uh, predict the load the, the, uh, generation interconnector flows in a uh, deterministic manner. So they have their best forecast that they provide. Um, they run an optimal power flow and then they come up with some line loadings for different lines under a certain contingency. Now at Insight, what we do is we uh, try to uh, extend this, this deterministic um, approach towards a probabilistic approach. So here we are modeling the interconnector flows in a probabli uh, probabilistic manner. So instead of providing our best guess for a certain time step, we provide the full distribution. And this helps to capture the uncertainties that arise from these interconnectors. So in the next step, what we do is based on these probabilistic distributions for all the interconnectors, is we create realistic uh, scenarios for which we run many, many uh, optimal power flow simulations with some additional tools to speed up uh, the computational process. So that means that we have now a whole bunch of scenarii uh, for the head, and that leads or that gives us the uh, um, ability, let's say, to instead of having a deterministic congestion forecast, to translate that into a probabilistic congestion forecast. So. On the x-axis, you see the, uh, the flow uh, expressed for a certain line under a certain contingency, expressed in megawatt, and then on the y-axis, you have a probability. If we are in a deterministic case, let's say there, we have a congestion forecast uh, of 970 megawatts on this line. We see that the maximum capacity in, in this example is 1,000 megawatts, so there is no predicted congestion. But in the end, let's say we ended up with a flow of 1,010 megawatts, so in the end, there was some congestion. So here we just, in the deterministic approach, we can say there is congestion, there is no congestion. Here we would like to extend that uh, towards a probabilistic congestion forecast where we could provide system operators with much more richness in their output in the sense that um, system operators based on these graphs could look at the worst case congestion, for example. They could look at different percentiles of the distribution or they could compute what is the probability that there will be a congestion. So here we try to give much more richness in, in the output uh, to um, system operators so that they can be, uh, make more uh, risk-based uh, decisions. Um, and that uh, leads me to the end of the presentation. I'm not sure if there is still some time left for some questions, and otherwise we uh, take them uh, afterwards uh, in the panel discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rafael. I propose maybe to keep the questions for, for, the, for the panel and uh, yeah, we'll discuss them. Okay. So let's move now to the second talk of this session. So second talk will be given by Professor Hussein Kazmi, uh, which is, who is currently assistant professor at KU Leuven here. 
and who's focusing on data science and decision support tools for the energy transition. So Hussein holds a PhD in electrical engineering from KU Leuven and two MSc degrees in sustainable energy technology uh, from uh, TU Eindhoven and Politecnico di Torino, as well as a BE degree in electrical engineering from the National University of Sciences in Pakistan. So in the past, Hussein has been a visiting researcher at Imperial College London, National University of Singapore, and KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. So he has contributed to over 50 peer-reviewed publications and played key roles in several clean energy startups. And one important fact, so in 2021, he won the International Institute of Forecasters uh, annual award for his research on value-oriented forecasting. So Hussein will talk to us today about the need of AI in the energy system. So Hussein, the floor is yours. Thank you very much in advance. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Hussain Ghazmi. I guess most of you already know me. Um, <laughs> this is going to be a quick talk about the need for more AI in power systems and why it's not enough just by itself. Uh, so I would like to start the talk with a brief anecdote um, about my own personal uh, history. So I started working uh, 15 years ago as a research engineer at a big bad oil and gas company and the objective there was to use machine learning to decide where to drill for oil. Um, so yeah, very different kind of work, um, but at the end of the day, the algorithms that we would be developing and implementing, they were quite similar to the ones that we work with uh, today. Uh, one big difference, of course, was in the, in the quality and quantity of data that we would have available to make these decisions uh, on where to drill for oil. It's also, of course, a very different kind of decision-making problem because you drill for oil once and then you're either successful or you do not hit any oil and then you have a dry well. Uh, so basically what the oil and gas exploration companies do in this context is that they, um, this worked. Yeah. So they basically acquire different types of data and this data is basically the most valuable commodity that they have. So it's not the oil, it's not the gas, it's actually all the data that they have their hands on. Um, and the idea is usually that you want to figure out before drilling what is underneath the surface of the earth. And to do that, you have different levers that you can press. So the first thing that you can do is you can acquire geological data. This is typically done in, a, in an invasive manner. So basically what you do is you drill uh, an exploratory well, and that tells you something about the geology of the land. Uh, if you hit oil, that's excellent. Otherwise, the sediments and all the other things underneath the surface also help you with uh, a lot of information. This is, of course, very expensive, as you can imagine. So what a lot of companies instead also invest in is geophysical data, which is basically doing stuff on the surface of the earth and then trying to figure out what goes on underneath the surface. Um, and this can provide you with a much more... Um, with a much higher range of uh, the amount of data that you can gather, but the quality of that data is much lower. Um, however, if you combine these two different types of data sets, that's basically what is valuable for the decision-making process. And at the end, you have something which looks like this, which is a huge 3D volume that spans hundreds of kilometers. And then you have the geophysical data, which is uh, something very blurry and vague. And then you have the well logs data, which provide you with much more higher uh, quantity and quality of data about a specific piece of the land. You can combine those two together, and then basically what you do is you end up with these surfaces um, for reservoirs. So basically this tells you how far and how wide does the reservoir for a hydrocarbon extend. This is a very different kind of problem where you have huge amounts of 3D data. 10, 15 years ago, this was already in the terabytes uh, that you would have to process, and that would not fit in a single laptop or in a single server even, so you would really have to come up with smart kinds of algorithms to process the data, to analyze it, and then make decisions based on it. And then when I moved to the clean tech sector, I found that basically what we work with is data like this that looks like time series uh, for several years. And then we consider that this is quite a lot of nice data because even this kind of data is not always available. So many times in the coming years, I would hear from people that we have excellent data, 
and you have a lot of data from the appliances, from buildings, from the transmission system or the distribution system, but in fact, what we would get would be a few time series of a few weeks or months. So, um, taking a step back, uh, why are we doing this? Uh, what do we want to do? We want to have the energy transition completed successfully as soon as possible. And to do so, we need to have more renewables on the power system. We need to have more electrification of demand. And we also need to have much more energy efficiency on the, on the demand side. Um, and to do this, what we need to do is we need to build better predictive algorithms uh, that take as input data and produce decisions, uh, control decisions, but they can also be forecasts of the type that uh, our colleague from Enside was just describing. So all of this requires data. Uh, but to do that, we also need algorithms. And that's basically one of the first fallacies that a lot of our students fall into, um, including me, I guess, at some point as well, that uh, to do this, we need to have better algorithms. But what I would say instead is what we need to do is we need to invest a lot of time and effort into gathering more and better quality data. Now, the reason why I say this is because uh, of three different broad categories of problems that we see with energy data specifically energy data that pertains to the energy transition and not the energy data that uh, is gathered by big, bad oil and gas companies. Uh, the first one is data scarcity. Um, and this is quite critical for building AI systems because if you do not have a lot of data, then you cannot really build a lot of data-driven methods. Um, the first reason for why we have very little data is privacy. Uh, we see this quite a lot in conversations around smart meters. So this is basically a map of uh, smart meter proliferation in 2022. Things have changed slightly since then, but even so, this data is not always available for you to process. So this is uh, kept under lock and key by the companies that are acquiring this data. Uh, the second one, and this is often overblown, um, but not in the, in the right way, is the idea that the data needs to be secured and there needs to be a lot of cybersecurity going into the system. But essentially what that translates into, no one wants to share any data uh, with researchers or other people who would be able to do useful things with them. And the final one is also a conspiracy theory. So there are a lot of reasons for why there are not more smart meters, but uh, I will not get into those here. Um, so there is also the second broad category, which is a problem with data quality. Uh, so even once we have gathered a few data points, you often run into a lot of problems with the data quality. Um, so we have missing data points. We have other types of uh, issues in collected data points. So this is basically the two biggest um, energy demand data sets that currently exist, open source. Um, this one is from Ireland. This one is from the UK in London. And these are basically electricity demand profiles for thousands of households for a couple of years. And if you want to do residential demand response and other types of studies, these, these resources are basically the holy grail uh, that you have to work with. But if you look at uh, what is happening inside the data, then you see that there is a huge amount of diversity in the data quality that we get with these uh, data sets. So, for example, with the London data set, the black uh, streaks on these plots, they are missing data. So, all of this region in the data that we have gathered um, is basically missing for several thousands of households. So, you cannot really do a lot of useful things in that particular part of the data. <coughs> it's also always unclear because, for example, with the Irish data, it, it is much less uh, structured the missing data, and then that makes uh, dealing with missing data all the more problematic as well. The other problem with data quality is often what we see with um, data that you can acquire from uh, sources that should be reliable. So for example, this would be the ENSOE transparency platform, where you can really expect that the data that you get from transmission system operators should be very reliable. Um, because it relates to an entire country or bidding zone. Instead, what we see often is that this is not really the case. And this is, for example, the, the predictions and the actual observations for solar generation in 16 different European countries. Uh, it's not really surprising that we don't have a lot of data for the Nordic countries, but that's not the problem. The problem is typically in the Swiss 
In the Swiss electricity generation from solar, we also see quite a lot of issues for several years in the Austrian data. We also see a lot of data problems in the Dutch uh, solar generation. And these are things that have persisted for several years. So you really do not expect this um, in your data sets, but then those are the things that you get. And if you start to blindly build data-driven algorithms on top of this data, then of course you have the garbage in, garbage out problem. <coughs> the third broad category of issues, and this one we'll talk a bit more in detail about in the next couple of slides, is the problem of data bias. So I expect that every one of you has already heard about biased data problems and why this is a huge issue, especially once you get AI systems that um, interact with humans directly and influence people's lives. Uh, this is also a big issue for us in the power systems because typically what we do is we work with uh, what's known as non-IID non data, which means that the data is not randomly drawn from the entire distribution that it can be drawn from. Uh, so you can think about this in terms of uh, the grid operator makes sure that bad things do not happen on the grid. And that means that you do not have a lot of data with negative outcomes. So basically what your learning algorithm is going to see is a lot of things that went okay, but it will never get to see things that would not have been okay if things had gone just slightly differently. Uh, so that's a big problem with learning from this kind of biased data. Um, and some examples of that are following. Um, <coughs> so the first question that we would like to pose here is, uh, is there a way in which we can get rid of the bias in our data sets? And is there a way in which we can improve the learning performance of this kind of work? Um, so you can take a first shot at this using something that is known as collaborative learning. So this is something that we have worked on for several years in our research group. And the idea is generally that uh, when we talk about the energy transition, we talk about millions of distributed energy resources coming online. And you would want to model and control all of them for the energy transition to be successful. But that's a huge problem because it's impossible to get reliable and accurate data for all of them. Uh, so what you could do instead is you could uh, split those distributed energy resources into different types of categories. Uh, for example, heat pumps, electric vehicles, other types of batteries, et cetera, et cetera. And then you start to model them in those categories rather than you model each of the individual devices in, a gra in great detail. Once you start doing that, what you can do is you can combine all of the data that you have observed from different types of devices. Um, you aggregate that into a single data set, and then you start learning the dynamics of the systems under the assumption that all of them are basically identical or similar systems. So we were lucky enough to have a, a very nice data set to do so um, with a Dutch net zero energy neighborhood that was recently refurbished at the time. And every single one of those households was equipped with, the identi with an identical heat pump. And the learning problem that we had here was that we wanted to learn the behavior of the heat pump. So how much electricity would the heat pump consume to heat up the building or heat up a storage vessel? And then once you have this information, then you can use it to, to control when you turn the heat pump on and off in a way that the grid uh, safety and security is not compromised. So when we started doing this, we quickly saw that if we had data from a particular building, so this would be roughly the region in which we would be operating because we would have data for several weeks or several months for a particular household. And then we would use that to build a data-driven model for a heat pump. And that would lead to rather ter terrible performance. So the y-axis on this is the R squared, which you can think about as explaining the amount of variance in your outcomes uh, using the model that you're using. So the, the closer this value is to one, uh, the better your model is. A value of 0 0.5 or 0 0.4 does not really inspire a lot of confidence if you're going to use this for control purposes. Uh, but that's exactly the kind of values that we were getting when we were modeling these devices individually. But then once we started modeling them together in a collaborative fashion, we quickly saw that you could get very good performance in terms of the modeling accuracy. And that allowed us to use these, uh, these models in real world control loops that led to 20% savings in energy efficiency and several other benefits as well. Um, of course, this is great because this great 
this greatly reduces the amount of data that you need um, at the expense of having multiple identical systems that are operating. Uh, however, there are several problems with this as well because first, of course, you need several identical systems, but this is uh, a given with the problem statement. At the same time, you also have privacy leakage, which is a huge problem, uh, particularly with smart meter data. And you also have uh, the system um, remains susceptible to data biases. So if there are uh, different, um, if there are different biases in the data set, then you will still continue to struggle with learning a good model of the system that you want to control. Um, so this is a good example of this kind of data biases in action, where we had um, the collaborative learning running for multiple periods of time. And we also had it separated by the amount of collaborating agents uh, that were contributing to the model uh, with their data. And then the principal diagonal is rather easy to understand because this is a single agent or a single system for which we had data for one week. Um, and then understandably, you can see that the quality of the model is quite poor. Uh, so the predictions do not match the observations. So on all of these plots, you have observations on the x-axis, predictions on the y-axis, and you would want to have them on the diagonal line. Uh, this does not really happen if you have very few agents with very few um, data points, but if you do have a lot of agents and a lot of data points collaborating together to learn a single model, then you can see that the performance is excellent. However, what's arguably much more interesting is what happens on the off-diagonal um, in this particular case, that you have the 32 agents um, gathering data for only a single week versus a single agent gathering um, data for 32 weeks, which is basically eight months of data. Um, and what we saw here was that the results for this second case are much better than if you had multiple agents collecting data for only a single week. And the reason for that is simple because you have a very biased data set um, where you have um, data collection going on exclusively in a particular season of the year. Uh, but the heat pump itself actually depends a lot on the time of the year that you're operating in. So this is a good example of a data bias that then affects model quality, that then affects the quality of your control. Uh, that then means that you cannot really use these systems in practice. So I will wrap up in a couple of minutes. Um, but this is the idea that we have observational data. Um, and it is seldom IID distributed, so you cannot really count on this assumption in practice, and that leads to all kinds of problems, especially if you start learning this kind of data-driven models uh, without doing any other sanity checks. Um, one thing that you can do, and one thing that we have seen works quite a lot uh, of the times in practice is by using synthetic data. Um, by combining different types of physics information or simulators together with the, with the learning system, and that typically leads to much improved performances. Two examples of this are, the first one is that we basically showed that if you generate extreme data points that would never be seen by the, uh, by the learning algorithm otherwise, using domain knowledge, that greatly accelerates learning because now the system actually knows what would happen in these uh, in these extreme situations, and it can learn how to avoid them. The second thing you can do is what's known as domain randomization, which says that if you have a, sim a simulator of the system that you're trying to learn or model, even if it's imperfect, you can really sample many different copies of that simulator, generate data from that, and use that to further improve the performance of your learning and control algorithms. Okay, so that brings me to the penultimate slide, which is basically some of the work that we are doing to build on these realizations now. Uh, the first one is, of course, that as I have emphasized in this talk over and over again, the idea is that we need better data, we need more data, um, and we need it to be less biased. Um, and one way to do that is through establishing open data spaces, because otherwise what we see is that a lot of the PhD students, a lot of the master's students, they have to come in and they have to start from scratch. They don't really have access to a lot of data. Uh, so what we are trying to do is we are trying to fix that by creating some open data spaces where you can have open source data available and ready to use. The second thing that we are trying to do is also set up a similar kind of space for forecasting algorithms that we can then benchmark automatically and regularly. And the idea here is that if you have 
many different types of data sets and many different types of learning algorithms. You can simply bring them together and the idea will then be that you have a kind of a live running benchmark which provides you with insights on <coughs> which types of algorithms work well with which types of data sets. And the final thing that we are setting up now very recently is a day ahead market price um, dashboard which is uh, hopefully going to be open source but then it is going to work for Belgium to begin with and then you can go and see what happens on the day ahead electricity prices. Right, last slide. Uh, this is a shameless plug for the summer school that we run uh, on these topics uh, in the summer. So if you're an Arenberg doctoral school student, uh, a PhD student, uh, then you're free to join uh, for free. Uh, if you're a master's student, you can also come talk to me afterwards and we can see if we have some spots still left. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice talk, I was saying. So our last speaker for, for today is Professor Pascal Van Enterich. He is currently the director of the NSF AI Institute for Advances in Optimization, so AI for Opt, and the A. Russell Chandler Three Chair and Professor at Georgia Tech. So Professor Van Enterich has a master's degree in computer sciences and a PhD degree in computer science as well. Uh, from University of Namur in Belgium. So Professor Van Enterick designed and implemented several innovative optimization systems that have been in commercial use for over 20 years, including the pioneering CHIP and OPL systems. So his current research focuses on the fusion of machine learning and optimization with applications in energy systems, supply chains, manufacturing and mobility. So the floor is yours. Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm the last speaker left between you and, uh, and the reception, so I'll try to make this thing a little bit interesting. Uh, so th this is a quote that I like a lot, and so what I'm gonna do today is play a bunch of magic tricks. And hopefully at the end you will be convinced that these magic tricks are actually interesting. So uh, I'm, on a, uh, I'm an optimizer by training, so what I do is, uh, and, and I love optimization because when you want to solve an optimization problem, you have some input, you have a nice model, you give that to a solver and you get an output, which is the optimal solutions. And it can work these days for uh, optimization models that have you know, millions of variables, including integer variables. But sometimes uh, optimization is too slow. And this happens when you have essentially two cases. The first one is that uh, you have real time constraints and the optimization solver is too slow or you have a human in the loop, and typically human don't like to wait for 40 minutes before uh, getting an answer. And so this is exactly what we want to address in this talk. Can we actually uh, overcome the fact that optimization is too slow in those circumstances? But there is one thing that you know, plays in our favor is the fact that we typically work on very large infrastructure, and this infrastructure don't change very much. It can be the power grid, it can be uh, supply chain and manufacturing, the online, so I have to, oh gosh. Okay, so my voice is strong enough, but the mic is not strong enough to capture it. All right, so we work on, um, we work, so we work on, on big infrastructure that don't change very, very quickly. Uh, so the power system, uh, uh, manufacturing and supply chains. And so this is interesting because what we are really doing is solving these optimization problems over and over again on, on situations that are relatively stable. And so therefore what we are really trying to solve, what people in the world typically try to do is what is called parametric optimization. It's the same optimization problem, but some of the, some of the instance data is changing. Not everything, but a subset of the, of the instance data in the problem. And that's what we are trying to do. Now, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that, wow, if you have a distribution of input and you are trying to solve the same problem all over again, you know, we can use machine learning. And so what we would do is approximate the, the function that I've, sh sorry about this, the function that, um, the function that the optimization problems is doing from input to output. Now the pro so this is an example of what we may want to do. Uh, so this is an optimal, uh, an optimal power flow. And one of the things that you see there is that we have the input, which is essentially the net load, uh, reactive and, and, and active load. And what you want to, 
what you want to predict is essentially the set point of the generators. So this seems nice, except that you have this very annoying uh, physical and engineering constraint. So what you really have here is, a, is an empirical minimization problem, as they say in machine learning, but with, uh, real t with, uh, with, with uh, physical or chemical and, uh, in general, engineering constraints and business constraints. So, uh, so what we are going to do is design machine learning model that instead of no, not making this prediction correctly, are going to be trustworthy by design. So we are going to uh, generate solutions that you can actually deploy on critical infrastructure because they will be feasible. And at the same time, we will provide guarantees on the quality of these decisions. And finally, I will show you that these methods are scaling for very large problems. So, so we'll, you'll see problems with about a million input and about 60,000 output, uh, which is the size of some of the largest grid out there. All right, so that's the agenda. So I'm going to start with the reliability, and this is a little bit what you're going to see. So this is the most important slide. You can sleep afterwards if you want. Uh, but this slide is telling you what we are really doing. So we're going to have some input, as usual. And then we're going to have a prediction phase, which is going to be a physics-informed or chemical, you know, chemistry-informed uh, neural net. In this case, it's going to be physics-informed, where we capture Ohm's law, for instance, and we capture uh, Kirchhoff laws. And that's going to give us an approximation of what we are searching, an approximating value of the set points of the generators. And then we're going to repair this because this is an approximation. It's not feasible. It's not actually... Uh, it's not actually guaranteeing to satisfy any of the constraints. Uh, but we have these repair layers, which is going to generate a feasible solution. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. All right? Yes? Yeah, good. Okay. You like this? Okay. Good. So this is a visualization in two dimensions. Uh, again, we are going to do that for 60,000 dimensions, right? So this is super simplified. But what you see there is, this is my neural net. It predicts the set points of these two generators. And you see the optimal solution by the optimization solver. You see the proxy, which is almost on top of it. And then you see the machine learning model, which is outside the feasible region most of the time. And this is a tiny example, right? So what we are really doing with the repair step that I showed you before is that we are bringing this machine learning model back into the feasible region and hopefully an optimal solution. OK? All right? So. Uh, so again, uh, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to present how we do this parametric optimization. I'm going to skip this because I don't have the time. Uh, but I'm also going to show you something which is super interesting. is that uh, because of the speed that we're going to get with these proxies, we can do things that cannot be done in real time right now. And then I will show you actually, if I have the time, how we can use this as building blocks for uh, more uh, general optimization. Okay, let's do the, the first thing. So what you're going to see here is not the European market. It's the U.S. market, at least part of it. Uh, where And this is what people are doing uh, in the U.S. It's somewhat similar to the first presentation by Insight, but it's adapted to the U.S. context. So what they are deciding is, is again, the same thing. Which generators have to be committed on and off? And also what power they're going to generate and what reserve they have to provide. Uh, the, de the, the devil is in the detail compared to the European market. So this is, for instance, uh, the... Uh, the way MISO, which is the, the mid-continent uh, independent uh, system operator in the U.S. is doing, they have a first a day ahead security constraint unit commitment, which receive all the bits, uh, and there are a massive number of them, and they decide the commitment of the generators. They run a reliability commitment afterwards, about you know, two hours or six hours afterwards, uh, and now uh, they have the forecast for the, net, for, the, for the net load, essentially, and they see if they have to commit more generators. Every 15 minutes, they have another reliability commitment, which again, look at the situation at that point and decide if more generators have to be committed. And then finally, you have the real-time market where you decide exactly which generators are going to commit, uh, are going to generate which power and which reserve they provide. And then you repeat, okay? So this is a very abstract version of the main, uh, 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 the main problems that they solve. Uh, what you see there is uh, essentially the balance constraints. I'm showing only one. There is one per region in general. And then you have the reserve constraints, the engineering constraints, and then you see the transmission line constraints, which are typically soft, but the penalty is so high uh, that essentially these constraints are always satisfied. Okay? So I can't show you the U.S. data because this is control information. They can really make me go to jail if I show you that. So I'm going I'm, you have to assume now that you know, MISO is taking over the French system and running the French system. And so this is the real-time market okay, every five minutes. And you see the generation there. You see some of the, the renewable, the big ones are the nuclear generators. You see the reserve there. 
And the first time, you know, we, I got, you know, I got this visualization, I was very, very surprised by the speed at which everything is changing, uh, including, including, uh, including the reserve. All right. So uh, we have to, we have to learn this thing. Now, one of the things which is happening everywhere in the world is that you have a lot more volatility in the system. Okay, so you have uh, uh, renewable, uh, wind, solar, you have a lot of uh, solar panels on the roof. And now in the US, there is a dramatic electrification of the transportation infrastructure, which makes the net load much more difficult to predict. So one of the things that the independent system operator are very interested in is having kind of a, a, a risk assessment. I think it's very, very interesting that the, the, the speakers from inside actually talked about this as well. You see that there is a real need there. And so what they want is to run thousands of simulation to see what can happen during the day and what is the risk inside this system. And so every time you do this, you have a, you have a number of optimization problems. It's about 300 that you need to solve, one for every five minutes, the, the things that I've shown you. Uh, the first thing that we need is good prediction, again, so what you see there is the prediction of the net load of the system and uh, with conformal prediction. So we also quantify uncertainty us using this, these new methods of the intersection of computational statistics and AI. So we, we not only get the point prediction, this is for, you know, the entire day. And then you also see, uh, you also see the kind of the, the, the uncertainty quantifications, the interval that we have. And now we can run the, all these simulation and they take uh, approximately 15 minutes for one scenario. And we wanted to do that in real time, like one minute or something. So this doesn't work, right? So because we'll have a thousand scenario, each of which taking 15 minutes. Can we do better? That's where we use these proxies that I've talked about. So we are basically doing an optimization proxy for the security constraint economic dispatch. And it's basically a predictive algorithm. And then these two things where we restore the feasibility of the constraints. The first one is the power balance, and then is other reserve constraint. Uh, and so now if we can do that, and I'll show you the details of that in a moment, instead of taking 15 minutes, uh, we replace every one of these optimizations uh, solver by a proxy, uh, and you will see that this proxy takes uh, you know, around 10 milliseconds, and now you can solve this in five seconds. And so this is a game changer for the industry because they were not able to do that. And at this point, we can provide them with a tool that can actually do real-time simulation, real-time risk assessment in five seconds. How do we do that? We have these repair layers. I want to go into the details of those. The first one is super easy. Uh, so I show it to you in two dimensions, but in practice, obviously, you have 60,000 dimensions or something. And so what you do is either you have not enough power or you have too much power. And so what we use there is essentially, you know, uh, intuition from con the control system. And we're going to proportionally scale up or down the, all the generators. And so what is, you know, I won't go into the details, but one of the things that you have to see there is this is very nice as a formula because it's essentially differentiable everywhere. And therefore, we can do subgradient optimization on it. Uh, the other one for the reserve is more complicated. Again, in 2D, this is the feasible space for the constraints. We are outside typically with the prediction, and then we have to restore feasibility. You can actually increase uh, the generator if it's not at, at its limit. And if it's at limit, you have to decrease, uh, you have to decrease its, its you know, energy side, uh, put more reserve for that generator, but that also means that another generator is gonna provide more energy. And so once again, you have to run this, you have to decide this differentiable program that's gonna generate essentially this control system for uh, this control instruction for every one of the generators. Uh, this is fake, obviously, right? So this is the machine learning model doing this. But it simulates the, the control. And then, essentially, this is also nice because it's also, you know, completely differentiable almost everywhere. And so what we have is that we predict. We restore feasibility of the, of the bond constraints using uh, sigmoid layers. And then we have this, uh, this, this formula that, that basically restore feasibility, and they are differentiable everywhere. So your loss function that you are using for training the machine learning model can now be back propagated through this and adjust all the coefficients of the neural net. And that's what we are doing. All right? So, um, no, uh, what, so the previous talk told you the importance of data. So we are assuming that we have a good data so that we know what the, what the, 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 the generation, uh, the, the, the renewable generation can be, what the load can be. We don't need actually any, any to, to solve any of these optimization problems. What we're going to do is what is called self-supervised learning. So we know it need the architecture, the machine learning architecture that I've shown you. And then we use the objective function of the optimization problem to train the network. So this is called self-supervised learning. It doesn't need to solve any of the optimization problem offline. We just need a good description of what can happen in the next day. And typically, you have good predictions, as the previous speakers have shown you. Okay? Now, this is the time that it takes to actually run these things. 
10 milliseconds uh, on a system which is about 30,000 buses. So these are some of the largest grid in the, in the world. So we take 10, can you imagine 10 milliseconds? This is nothing, right? Uh, this is the time to train this thing for uh, the 13 bus here, which is simulating part of the European system. It takes about uh, 18 minutes to train the system. So it's also very fast. We can train that the day before. We can even train that the, the, the hour before because it's fast enough, okay? Uh, this is the accuracy of the model. So you see, except for the French system, this is always below 0.5%. The French system is the most engineering system in the world, probably, and therefore it's a little bit more di you know, difficult to predict. Uh, they have a lot of uh, shifters and transformers and all kinds of interesting devices. Uh, so once you have that, you can apply all the risk metrics that you want. And so uh, this is a simple test case so that you can visualize it. Uh, but look at these two images. This is uh, the, the optimization and this is the proxy. Can you see a difference? Almost not, right? So there is this one line where we're estimating the risk a little bit higher. So what the system is very good at is finding exactly where the risk is. Sometimes we, uh, we are overestimating the risk, but we are not actually doing false alarms anywhere, uh, which all the, the existing techniques that, you know, that were proposed before were doing. Uh, this is the accuracy. You see Gurobi, the optimization solver. You see the, the, the machine learning algorithm that I just presented. Uh, they are very, very, very uh, close together. Uh, so this is, this is nice. Okay, now, so what I've shown you so far is that we can do a real-time risk assessment and we are guaranteed to find feasible solution. And I've told you experimentally that we have good guarantees on, well, we are, we experimentally we are close to optimal, okay? Now, people are always saying, yeah, 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 but do you have any guarantees? A good optimizer typically has to find a primal solution and a dual bond. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we asked ourselves actually, can we actually find a good lower bound? Okay, what do you think? Can we, can we find a good lower bound? So we took many years to think about this and the answer is obvious. Uh, but you know, uh, there is this book, I don't know if you read this book by Duncan Watts, and the title of, uh, of the book is, everything is obvious once you know the answer. And so this is completely obvious once you'll see the answer. So this is the kind of optimization problems that we are solving. And there is one thing which is amazing, right? So we have bounds on the variables and almost every real problem has that. And once you have that, the dual is amazing because we have these dual variables which correspond to these bound variables and we can do anything with them, right? So what we do is we are actually restoring feasibility very easily in the dual space. Why? Because we can predict the Y there, which are the things that we are really interested in. And then we can restore feasibility with the lambda and the gamma. So it's amazing. You can always find, what I'm telling you is that it's very easy to find a solution in the dual space, a feasible solution in the dual space. Uh, so this is what we do. We have another proxy where we have the input. We have a prediction as I've shown you before. And then this is actually a partial dual solution. It's not complete. But then we have these completion layers, which is like the repair layer. And it gives you a dual feasible solution. All right? So this is kind of uh, interesting, right? So now I can give you a primal and a dual solution. Now I'm going to skip all this for the for timing so that we have time for the for the discussion, but this is the same for the second order cone relaxation. And we predict some of the variables and then we restore this. And when we restore this here, we're doing something a little bit better so that we are as optimal as possible, well, as near optimal as possible. And so they, we are actually for the, for the completion layer using some of the optimality conditions of the, of the problem. And so this is my layer here. I'm predicting all these variables and restoring. And once again, what you see there is that I can use my dual objective and train these things end to end again. So again, self-supervised learning for training this. Uh, these are some of the results on some reasonable grid. We have about you know 1.5 percent of the of the of the exact uh, dual bound. Uh, so this is something that we are uh, further improving. It's actually uh, more difficult to get a high quality dual bound uh, compared to the primal. Uh, and I can explain to you that if, we, if, you, if you want, why this is the case. Uh, but roughly speaking, it's easier to get feasibility on the dual space, it's more difficult to get optimality, but we are still 1.5%, so we can in real time, in 10 milliseconds, give you our bad, you know, the, pr the, the primal solution that we give you uh, is uh, in, in, you know, in real time. All right, so I wanna show you this one because this one is actually pretty cool. Uh, this is scalability. I told you that we have to scale this to very large output space. So it's very different from a computer vision algorithm where you have to decide if something is a cat or a dog. Uh, here we have 67,000 dimension, right? 
So uh, if you try to do that for very large for this system, the machine learning model is going to be very big, trillions of parameters. Can we do better than that? So what you see there is a PCA transformation on the output, on the output, not the input, the output. And you can see that 99% of the output uh, can be predicted with 5% of the variable. So what we're going to do is a machine learning model, which instead of you know, uh, doing input-output, is going to do input to a set of principal component, let's say 5%, and then restore the other ones uh, using the inverse PCA transformation. And so we train the whole thing together. So we train the machine learning model, which is in the smallest space. And then we, dis uh, we also uh, learn uh, the, the PCA transformations on the fly. And that's what we do. All right. Oh, I didn't know I had that slide. Uh, but roughly speaking, so if you, if you had the, the convolution, the, 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 con the, the, the neural network that I presented to you, they would, they would have already 200 million parameters for about uh, a, you know, a system with 300 buses, 3,000 buses. So you can imagine that for the largest one, they would have trillions of parameters. Instead of that, we have about 16 million parameters. And so this is the accuracy of the system. You see that the optimality gap here is essentially lower than 0.5% again, except for this annoying French system. But I'm going to address that in a moment. All right, so uh, I've shown you, shown you uh, what we can do for finding primal, feasible, and scalable solutions to this, uh, to this system so far. What I'm going to do now is, uh, oh, you know who painted this? I'm trying to educate the entire US to Belgian culture, right? <laughs> And so uh, I always give them this one for primal dual. So what I'm going to do now is primal dual learning. So we are going to do, we are going to learn the primal and the dual at the same time, right? So typically, you know, when you use an augmented Lagrangian method in optimization, what you do is you solve a series of unconstrained optimization problems, which are easier to learn, right? So they are unconstrained. And you basically have the Lagrangian function there and uh, the violation of the constraints as an additional term with these rule parameters. And then, you know, the, so you, as, as soon as you solve one, you have a dual step which uh, updates the Lagrangian multipliers. And so what you're going to see is that what we're going to do is we are going to learn two networks at the same time. One is the primal network to, you know, learn what we want to learn. And then the second one is going to learn the dual. And we basically iterate between the two. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So we mimic the augmented Lagrangian, but we learn the primal and then we learn the dual. Uh, when we learn the primal, we solve this, we are basically approximating this unconstrained optimization problems. When we learn the dual, we are basically uh, um, uh, learning uh, the update step of the dual, right? And so what I'm going to show you uh, is how we can use this for doing a, a, a complete security constraints ACOPF. Okay, so uh, this is typically, if you lose a, a, gen a nuclear generator in France, uh, the first thing that you're going to do is primary response, stabilize the frequency, and then secondary response to do AGC, essentially. And so I'm going to show you one thing that can do both, uh, one at a time, right? And so this is the way you can do uh, a frequency response in, in, a, in a system like France. Uh, so you provide some, so you adjust the, you know, the generations of every one of the generators. You can do that up to a maximum. Uh, and one of the things which is annoying is that if you bump the maximum generation of one of the generators, you have to readjust everything else. So it's not like you can scale them in one step. So you have this minimization thing that you need to do. And you need to find this global signal that you send to everyone, but that global signal depends on whether you bump into some of the generation limit. Uh, so this is, the, this is the participation factor, and that's the proportional response, the signal that you send to everyone. So we, uh, about four years ago, we, f we solved this. Um, we had you know, probably what is the best algorithm for solving these things. And what you do is you basically generate the infeasible contingency, the contingency where there are violations incrementally, uh, because otherwise you would add a massive number of discrete variables that you don't want to do. Okay? No, that algorithm works, but it's not very fast. I'm going to show you in a minute. So instead of that, we are basically using this uh, neural net that is basically trained. It's like what I've shown you so far, but on steroid, because I have to do the nominal case. Uh, but then I also have to do all the contingencies there. And we use the same kind of techniques that we have in the other one. We have a binary search for finding the infeasible contingencies. And then we basically uh, uh, find how much we can adjust these generators and what is the, uh, what is the violations of the constraints. And so. Uh, yeah, this is the binary search. I'm not going to enter into this, but this is something that we compute. This is, again, a differentiable program, and it's going to generate all kinds of interesting, you know, again, differentiable, you know, steps that we have to do. And so uh, the interesting thing that, that, that is here is that 
Uh, this takes about, you know, the, this is the, the optimization algorithm, uh, which on the French system would take about 2.5 hours. Obviously, we have to do that in five minutes, and it's tough. Uh, and so the machine learning model essentially does that again in 10 milliseconds. And so once again, you can solve this problem now, and I'm going to show you the fidelity in a moment, extremely fast. And you can actually, for the first time, apply this really n minus 1, complete n minus 1 contingency uh, with the exact proportional response of the generators. And so this is the accuracy of the system. Again, you know, on everything is about 0 0.5, you know, be below 0 0.5 uh, percent, except the French system, which is a bit higher. But remember, we cannot do that in real time right now. So this is a big game changer. And we have zero violations of the constraints. Okay? So how much time do I have left? 15 minutes? Oh, gosh, I can go back to the stuff that I did before. Okay, I want to show you one more thing. I want to show you one more thing. So I love Lego blocks. And so I want to show you that we can actually do machine learning and, and actually design machine learning model that can be composed in more complex optimization. OK? So, uh, so one of the things that you have is you, if you have a machine learning model, a neural network with ReLU, uh, uh, ReLU activation function, you can actually take it and encode it as a mixed integer program. Right? You can do that. The problem is that this, this is discrete, obviously you have discrete variables, and therefore if you put it in something uh, which is another optimization, it's going to be really annoying. It's going to be really inefficient. So one of the things that we are trying to do is you know, to, do, to try to do better. And so this is convex optimization, which is really nice. So can we actually design a neural network which is convex and that we will be able to embed in other optimization? Okay, and so I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, so we are going to show, I'm going to show you that this input convex neural network are actually pretty good at uh, estimating DC OPF or DC, you know, security constraints, economic dispatch, or even AC OPF. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit how that works. So uh, this is the uh, convex network. It's going to have exactly the same layers as before. Okay, the only change is that this matrix here can only have neg non-negative weights. Okay, they cannot be negative. Okay. Now, we can do a little bit better than that. We can have the first layer, which has negative and positive uh, uh, weights. And then we can add also uh, uh, these, these skip connections that are really important. So you have essentially the input going everywhere in the network. Now, you may not see it easily, but this is, a more, this is an illustration of what this is. So this is your input. This is the output. Uh, the first layer can be completely arbitrary the way you want. All these layers here can only have non-negative weights. And then you have the skip connection, which takes the inputs of these layers and give it to every one of the other layers, such that they have more inputs. Okay? That's the kind of networks that we are going uh, to design. And those networks are guaranteed to be convex. They are actually representing a convex function. Okay? Whatever the parameters you have, you're going to get a convex function. Okay, so now we have, uh, and so the other things that these networks have is very good generalization properties. What does that mean? That means that if I have a set of input, okay, and I have the convex cell of all these input, everything inside that convex cell is going to have good, is going to have a good prediction. And we can provide a theorem that, does, that tells us that. So inside the convex cell, we are guaranteed that, you know, the, 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 the model is going to predict correctly. And so this is a theorem which is basically saying, okay, so this is input, primal solution, dual solution, and this is the convex cell of this, and you are guaranteed that uh, you get a bound, okay, a constant, okay, you can get a constant that's going to only depends on the value of the function that you are trying to approximate, and then its gradient. And so you can provide that there exists a bond that does that, so you have good generalization properties. Okay? Now let me show you the result, which are kind of an, an interesting. Now I'm not, I'm not predicting here the set point of the generators. That's not what I want. I want to predict the objective value, because this is typically what you want to do when you do benders decomposition or when you do column generation. You want to approximate the function and its gradient. And this is what we can do with this convex network. You get an, uh, uh, an object, you get a, a convex function, and obviously, you know, you get this, it's derivative automatically. And so this is all, you know, this, the second order cone is approximated here. Uh, this is the, this is the, a, a normal neural network, and this is the convex neural network. Obviously, that problem is convex. And so what you see is very, very precise, much less variance, and, you know, really, 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 th this is the error, right? It has to be around zero, right? And very, very close approximation. This is ACOPF. You are actually approximate ACOPF better with this convex function that we could do with uh, the, the, the arbitrary neural network. Why? Because it's easier to train. Well, it's not really easier to train, but there are fewer parameters. You have fewer degrees of, of, free, of freedom. 
And so this is also very, very interesting in a sense. And the intuition there is that most of the time this function is convex, except that it has this continu well, it's, it has this jump, uh, which are not convex at this one point. But it's very, it's like you know what you are doing is really capturing kind of a, a, a set of piecewise convex, you know, convex functions there. So, uh, so, so once again, once you have that, you have a convex function, you can take this, different, this, this gradient as well, and you can embed that in a, you know, let's say in a Bender's decomposition or something like that. That's what we are doing now for predicting, you know, doing the, the hydro uh, system in Brazil. Uh, so what I told you is that we can do risk, uh, risk minimization under constraints. Uh, we can find uh, uh, machine learning model or differentiable programs that are trustworthy by design. We are guaranteed to provide, a, 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 on, the, on the test cases that I've shown you, we are guaranteed to find primal solution which can be deployed and we have also performance guarantees that we can find in real time. So I can give you at the same time a primal and a dual bond. Uh, we are also trying to do a kind of general uh, verification now where we are trying to say what is the worst case, whatever the input is inside you know, the distribution. Uh, I've shown you that this is scalable to about, you know, very large system that are basically used in practice, okay? So that's what I want, so, and, and what you have to, you know, remember is this beautiful picture that I took, you know, ages to draw, uh, but this is, uh, this is the proxies and that's what we are using behind the scene, okay? Uh, so, so one of the things that I'm claiming is that we are basically designing a new wave of optimization technology, not for replacing the old one, uh, we don't want to do that, but just for cases where the old one doesn't work, doesn't work fast enough. That's what we are really doing. Uh, the key points here is differentiable programming. So it's really, you know, you, you, you design functions that are completely differentiable all, almost everywhere. And then self-supervised learning. You don't need to solve all these optimization problems to learn from them. You basically have a loss function that represents the optimization. And then we can do that for solving problems that we couldn't solve before. And then uh, we can also uh, do building blocks that we can put in more general optimization. Okay? Uh, yeah, I'll leave it there and I'll be very happy to take any questions afterwards as well. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very dense talk. Very interesting. <laughs> so you know time for question and answer. Maybe I propose the speakers to, to join to join me here in front of the scene. So what I propose you to do is maybe to 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 let you free to ask a question in the, in the order you want. I think you know, we were very, uh, I, I will first, you know, leave the audience to, 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 to speak, the, to ask the questions to the three speakers we had. So yes, I know that we have a remote audience as well. So I guess colleagues do not hesitate to, to tell me uh, when uh, there are some questions coming from, from the remote audience as well. And I will try to, to ask them, to translate them to, to our speakers. So who wants to start first? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, maybe a first question to, to Pascal, actually. Um, in the beginning, you sort of made the statement, right, that the, that the infrastructure that we are looking at doesn't really change a lot over time. But then, of course, from, let's say, the, the power system engineer's point of view, uh, we are always interested in, in edge cases where maybe uh, there, is a, there is an outage in the system, or maybe the system is really stretched to its limits in an, I would say, uh, unpredicted way. And then um, how robust or how reliable are then these techniques in such circumstances? Obviously, I expected that question, right? So I think on the on the extreme cases, what the things that we model, uh, I mean, we we have we have good scenarios, right? So if you do the so one of the things that they are interested in th this real time risk assessment that I've shown you at the beginning, they are interested in to know what is going to happen in the day. They have predictions, you know, that I've shown you on you know the kind of uncertainty. They have an uncertainty quantification in a system like MISO. They can lose all the wind in three hours. 
they will actually notice that, right? So they, they, their, their forecasts are going to say there is a risk uh, to that this happens. And so we can capture that in the tr you know, when you are training the proxy such that it's actually, it has actually enough input data uh, for, uh, for capturing that. So it's, it's, it's automatically done. Now what, and so when we also train the data, it's very similar to uh, what has been done before. We are actually stretching, we are actually generating data which is uh, taking the correlation between the various, the various inputs and scaling them such that we stretch the system and we make it congested as much as we can. So we have inside the training data, we have that as well. We are basically generating the distribution that we, will, that we think could happen in the, on the next day. Now, there can be things that are more difficult to predict, like you can lose the generators. That's why I wanted to show you the N minus uh, ones, uh, the N minus one uh, case that we can actually learn very nicely. What is, uh, what is also interesting that we are working on right now is topology optimization. Uh, this is very, you know, the French uh, operator is very interested in that. Uh, they typically don't do that on a real-time fashion right now. They do that the day before. And so you saw the speed at which we can train the, mo the model. The, the model that we have, we can train them in about 20 minutes for the French system. So we could actually train them the, next, the day before if you have a reasonable you know, uh, computing cluster. And therefore, for the next day, we could do that. Now, if you want to do topology optimization in real time, we have some more work to do. Uh, we are not yet there. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. And actually, we work with Giacomo uh, and, and the team to actually do things like this. Uh, that's an open topic at this point. I don't know if we can do it. Uh, it's more difficult, uh, but we'll see, you know, we'll see what we can do. Maybe next year, if I come back. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I, th there was one there. Okay, link to this. Okay, so same, related at least. No, but for the remote audience, I think I will pass you the mic and... Uh, I have a couple of questions uh, for Hussein. So uh, you mentioned that the accuracy with multiple targets gathering data points over, say, shorter time interval is less than that with a single target gathering data points over a longer time interval. So how do we compare these two cases with multiple targets gathering data points over, say, a representative time samples over a longer period? Would that be more accurate? Then I'll ask my second questions also. Uh, yeah, and uh, so as I understand, uh, we need multiple identical targets. So how non-identical targets have to be for collaborative learning to fail? Thank you. Are the questions clear for you? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I guess this still works? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the first question, I guess, was um, really relating to this kind of question. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, sorry, so uh, the accuracy with multiple yeah. uh, targets gathering data points over yeah. a short time interval would be less than. Yeah. So, so I guess like it's the question is like, about what kind of data bias are you really targeting? So in this case, there is a very strong seasonality to it because like heat pumps are um, well only activated during the winter season, for example. And then if you collect data during the summer period, then you don't really learn a lot of, um, of useful things by operating the system in that time. Um, so it's really like a function of when do you really operate the system. So if you get data from the winter, doesn't really apply to the summer again. So it's like this kind of time dependence there. Um, the other thing that happens with the, with the agents is that like, for example, how are they using the system? And that's also different for all of them, right? Because what we were showing was um, data that was gathered in several different households. And then each of them is driving the system in a particular way, which is different than the others. So there again, you have some dis uh, some distributional differences in how they're using the system. And then the question is like, which one of them is the stronger effect? So for example, if you talk about the individual users, uh, we see that for example, a uh, degenerate case in this case is when you have a user that does not use the system at all. And then you do not really learn a lot of things that are useful about the system. So if you have that kind of agent, then it's not very useful, even if you operate it for eight months. 
So it's really like a question of like what kind of agent and what kind of seasonality, and there is no real general answer here um, that you can get. So, so it really depends on the system. Yeah. So what if we use uh, what if we feed data over a long long period, but representative time samples for multiple targets? Would yeah. So like this idea of representative dates is interesting, but then it doesn't really capture the question of extreme events, um, which is perhaps what you also want to learn. But yeah, the representative days, they could be like a part of the year at one point and a part in a different time. But that also doesn't necessarily translate well to when you have to go into operational mode and then you just have uh, live data coming into the system. So this was really with live data from a company. Um, and then they were just like gathering time series that were then processed in the system. But coming to your second question. Uh, yeah, how non-identical the yeah. uh, yeah. agents have to be. Yeah, so I was also expecting that question and I had a slide about it, uh, but I could also share that later. But the idea is that uh, we were able to take heat pumps that were created by different manufacturers, so completely different types of heat pumps. And then the idea there is that instead of doing purely collaborative learning, you do something like a two-step process where you pre-train the network with one set of data, uh, which is like, let's say, collaboratively done. And then you take those weights and then you fine tune them using uh, the sparse observational data from a second different set of uh, heat pumps, for example. So, and in that way, uh, it doesn't really matter because as long as they are similar-ish, uh, you can really get good performance results, but we don't have any theoretical guarantees uh, on that yet. So that's something for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So other questions in the audience or, yes, Dirk, I'm passing the mic to you. And then I will give the opportunity to the remote audience maybe to ask one after Dirk, if there is some. <laughs> Not yet? Um, yeah, basically, I have two questions. The first one is, is more on the accuracy of your model. We know that we're off, but uh, uh, with your objective function, maybe you don't have the perfect value, you're just half a percent off. But is there a consistent bias um, throughout the data space, or are there some that are always off, uh, some decisions? Because that might give some... Uh, interesting side effects and you might punish some users a little bit more than others. Is there any data on that in the methods? Because you might accept a method that is, let's say, 1% off, but always consistently spread over all users or generators or whatever. Um, that was uh, the first question. The second question is maybe more general through all three. I find it very hard to convince system operators to use fancy methods and they're usually not as fancy as what you have presented. So how easy is it, and will that be easier in the future when they absolutely have no idea what to do anymore and that they will accept to go all the way because this goes very far beyond current day practices what an engineer is pushing a power flow, checks what the data is, and then decides by himself. So how can we move the transition towards acceptance uh, by users? So I guess. The question was for Pascal. The first question was for Pascal. Thank you, Dirk. So the first one, I think, was more for you. The second one, yeah. I think, for all three. Yeah. Offer both. I mean, whoever wants to do one. I thought you saying would take the first question. <laughs> all right. Okay. So, the, so it's a, it's a good question. So I think I think the the answer is that uh, there are there are uh, there are regions inside the space which are more difficult than others. Uh, if you have if you have no if you have very low load, it's very easy. You're going to take the cheapest generator. If you have very high load, which stress the system tremendously, you're going to essentially commit everyone. So that's not where the difficulty is. There are these regions that we find where it's actually more difficult to actually predict. And so we use, I didn't talk about that, but we use technique like active learning for actually generating more samples in those regions. Now, the accuracy, and so, the, so what we get is an accuracy which is essentially consistent across everything when we do that. Now, one of the question is, where do, you know, we, we are not perfect, so where do we lose? Where do we lose that? And so we have a bunch of. Uh, I had the question this morning when you know I gave a, a similar talk this morning uh, on the other on the other Leuven side, well, the, the, on the Leuven side. And so the the and the key point, the, the one thing that we have is that there are some outliers. 
a, a little bit everywhere. And we don't really understand why, you know, we have these outliers. They would have five to 10% sometimes, you know, uh, uh, error. Uh, we obviously, we detect that, but we don't know exactly why. So we are looking into this. My suspicion is that we are at a, you know, it may be the, the way the data has been come out is, is very unusual and is very bizarre. And because we actually generate noise around, you know, data that we have, so it may be the case, or it may just be the case that it's very difficult to approximate there and you make a little mistake and it has a high cost. So we don't really know. I have a student looking into this. It's a great question. But the key point is that we are consistently good except from these outliers. Uh, but again, you know, if you do active sampling and you generate enough sample at the region which are difficult. Now regarding your second question, I'll let you answer it afterwards. Uh, what we, so we, the, the risk, the real-time risk assessment is something that the operators want. They don't have it, and so for us, it's not too difficult to actually convince them. So I had to get some letters of collaboration last week. I contacted a bunch of ISOs, and they are very easy to convince for actually supporting that because they need that. The volatility is such that they are worrying in this system. So I think this is not, we are not trying to replace a system that they have. We are trying to do something that they cannot do. And they are very worried about some of this volatility right now. Also the reliability of some of the generators and so on. They want better method for actually uh, evaluating risk. And so that's, that's an easy one for us. Uh, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not even trying to tell them use machine learning all the time because that's a lost cause. As you know, it took 10 years to move from Lagrangian method to the MIP solvers for the unit commitment. So it's really trying to say you cannot do this, but with the new tools you can do it. Uh, there will still be, you know, kind of a lot of hurdle in actually making sure that they understand what the system is doing, doing counterfactuals. But that's, uh, that's how we actually work with them. We tell them we can do something that currently you cannot do, and they are worried about some of these issues. So I'll, I'll let you guys uh, talk about this. Yeah, uh, I guess some of our experiences are, are shared in this, in this field as well, like talking to Ilya, talking to other TSOs and trying to get them to push the needle on some of this work. Um, I guess that there are some easy wins here with forecasting, which could benefit greatly from using more machine learning. Um, and then there, it's quite easy to show that you can get better accuracy, but then the, that's where the chain of reasoning breaks down because like it's always unclear like how much is this actually costing in terms of euros, and that's typically a different team. Um, what I find a bit strange with some of the TSOs, like with Svenska, is that there is a bunch of engineers, there is a bunch of uh, TSO, uh, sorry, there is a bunch of data scientists, and they're usually like mutually um, exclusive in terms of their, their skill set. Like one is a bunch of guys with machine learning, one is a bunch of guys with en energy engineering, and then it's usually quite tricky to get them to talk to each other. So I hope that with more education, that's just going to be fixed in the coming years. But I don't really see a short-term fix, except that when they have to do something like this with, a, with an incentive from the regulator, let's say. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And, and, and we're still trying also to, uh, to convince all other TSOs. Uh, but what we see uh, more speci uh, specifically to forecasting is um, that system operators are not only focused on uh, performance, but also on drivers behind the forecasting model, like understanding how and why a prediction, certain prediction is made. Um, and then we're also putting a lot of effort at end side. So that's more on the trans uh, transparency dashboard that we are developing, and that's um, to identify the key drivers. Um, so there, we also have our techniques that try to take really like the isolation of certain features out of, uh, let's say, like in isolation, where we can say, uh, look, this prediction is driven by such megawatts, for example, because of that specific feature in isolation. So that's a bit on transparency. Uh, I also do agree that there is a lot of things uh, related to also scenario generation, etc. So that's how system operators are also working now. They try also to speak a bit the same language. So we try to give tools and suggestions, but with a kind of flexibility for system operators to still um, perform some indeed uh, simulations on the fly uh, as well. Yeah, thank you. So one more thing to add is that generally there are operators in the room, right? So and I think the only people that you really need to convince are these operators. And so when, when you go into one of these operation rooms, uh, what you see is that they are actually, they have forecasting tools already, they have optimization tools already. 
And what they do is a lot of, you know, looking at different scenarios or adjusting the prediction. I mean, I was seeing one, one the real-time operator was saying, huh, I don't trust this wind prediction. I'm going to adjust it. And they adjust them and they see what is happening to the system. So some of the things that they would get for free, you know, we, we are do, by, by doing some of the things that we are doing, they, they are doing manually. And so we could have a much more systematic approach. But what, you know, one of the things that we discover is that in almost everything we do, there are operators in the loop. And the only people that you really need to convince are these operators. And so if you go to them and they are confident in the system, they will go up the ladder and tell the manager we need that. So I think this is really convincing the operators and giving them the tools to experiment. At least in the US, right? So I don't know the, I don't know the Ukraine market. Thank you for this. Um, we, have, we have a question here first, and then I'm pass it to you. Um, my question is to Professor Pascal. Uh, so uh, it's mainly about the physics in cooperation, like the physical uh, constraints that you are using for the um, convex input neural network. Uh, usually, uh, a thing that is a bit challenging is to decide what exact physics equation do we have to use in order to make the model more physics aware. So how do you actually decide, like, okay, this equation is actually working? Is it just based on the loss value? Like, okay, output loss is decreasing, and then that's the repair layer mostly? Or because I work with building physics mostly, and I'm, I'm also using physics-informed neural network. Yeah. But in our case, it's more like thermodynamic heat, heat equation based on RC models. And um, so yeah, um, my question is like, how do you actually decide like, okay, this is the right physical equation I'm gonna use for the constraint and this is not, so. Yeah. I think that's a great question. So I think one of the things that we are trying to do is to first mimic what they do uh, inside a system. And so the economic dispatch, the security constraint, the, yeah, economic dispatch that I've shown you, is actually what they are really using for clearing the market right now. So if you start putting a more COPF, that's what I think they will need in the future, given the, given you know the volatility of the wind and so on. They will have to take reactive power into account. I think the ECOPF is something or or uh, or a convex approximation of it, is what they will need to do. And the, the dynamics, uh, the, you know, they are also interested in actually you know capturing some of the dynamics. So I think there are different granularities of the models that you will do for different types of studies. And so it depends what they want to do. But we, we can do almost, you know, every one of them. Obviously, the computational cost and the accuracy of the, of the, of the, mo the, of the, uh, the, of the machine learning models is going to be different. But this is one of the, the areas that we are really interested in, in actually doing. So we want to actually capture more of the dynamics, kind of the exciters and the stabilizer that we have for the generators as well. So that's one of the things that we have a project to do as well. Uh, but we are, you know, I mean, that's going to be much more complicated as well. But once again, I mean, these things, you know, th the physics is helping you. In, in so this is what I tell people in machine learning here. The physics is helping us. It's not that, you know, there is an adversary. Uh, the fact that these systems are working is, uh, is, is helping us. And so I think the control system is there to help us. And we just have to model it in a, in a reasonable fashion and, and detect, you know, anomalies on, on what can happen. That's, that's what I think is, is really interesting in this case. It's not like we are modeling something that doesn't work. It's actually, it's actually working, more or less. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone want to compliment that? No? Thank you. Another question? We had a question here. Uh, uh, my was pretty simple question. I wanted to understand better why it's so important to train the model fast. Because you said, okay, it, it takes one hour, but uh, in my mind is if you have all the data, good data available, you train it once and then you use the same model. So where is the added value then? Yeah, so, so one of the things which is very difficult is to train a very general model that could take all the possible commitments, all the possible topologies, all the possible loads that can happen. So we don't want to do that because currently we don't know how to do that. So what we do is that after the day ahead, I mean, it's a little bit the same in the, in, the, in the European market as it is in the US. You have the commitment after the day ahead. So we know for every hour of the day what's going to be the commitment of the generators. And therefore, why don't we use that information? And we train, you know, 24 different, actually more than 24. Well, essentially what we do is training 24 different models that are going to be applied to every one of these 24 different commitments. And therefore, we train a model which is much easier. 
But you know, to do that, I have to be, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to take, you know, uh, like, you know, 10 days. I need to do that in the 10 hours that I have before they start the market, right? And so this is why we want these models to be uh, much faster. Also, if they decide to do some topology optimization during the midday, I want to be able to retrain my model such that I can actually do that topology optimization very quickly. So you have seen that some of the models that we have, you can train them in 15 minutes. And that basically means that if something happened to the system, I can retrain very, very fast. Ob obviously, you have, to have all the infrastructure to do that. But th theoretically, at this point, we could do that. We can retrain all the model for the rest of the day. That's why we want these things to be, uh, to be, uh, uh, to be trained very fast. So we call this just-in-time learning. So we have a paper on that. And I think the justification here is that if something changed, we can retrain very, very quickly. And what is this data set that you are getting all like updating in real time? So for instance, you have better forecast on the wind, better forecast on the solar, better forecast on the load. You may, you may detect that, you know, uh, I think, uh, I think the, you know, uh, the other speakers were talking about extreme event. In a system like MISO, sometimes they lose the wind and it's like 10 gigawatt of wind that they lose in the next three hours. They're going to lose that. So they can see it coming, right? But they have to be able to train the model for something that will not have wind. Uh, although they expected to have wind the day before. And so you have to be able to retrain the model very fast to do that. You see what I mean? And so that's the kind of things where we want very fast training. Uh, because there's this, some of these extreme events, you may not be able to predict them the day before. Uh, you may have some indication that they may happen. But then on the day, because this happens because the temperature goes really cold and then the wind suddenly stops. Right? And so I think they w do we have to be able to, you know, you will see the temperature dropping, dropping, dropping. And at some point you want to train the network such that you don't have wind anymore. But that's a very different context than assuming that you have 10 gigawatt of wind. Right? So I think that's, the, that's, the, that's a big difference. You yeah. see what I mean? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe a, a connected question to that. Oh, you wanted to complement you saying? Yeah. yeah please. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, just to add to that, that it's also usually a good idea to recalibrate your model periodically with more information anyway, especially if there are chances that there is something non-stationary in your data set. So like, for example, we also see this quite a lot with market prices and with also other things that, for example, if you recalibrate your model every day, for instance, then you get much better performance than if you were to only do that once a week, once a month, once a year or something. Um, so even if you're not like, let's say, pre-training this kind of model, it's still usually a good idea to at least recalibrate the weights with the updated data that you have. Um, yeah. Yes, and Rafael, in, in that respect, because this was, this was a question I was about to ask to you about recal recalibration. Do you have any special ins to advise us? Because as a company, you're providing AI services to, to clients, which may be system operators or even energy related companies, but uh, how often do you have to recalibrate your models? Is this something that you, you propose, th that you are studying? Can you complement, uh, comment a little bit on this? It, it's, it's something that we indeed, uh, it's uh, yeah, something that we indeed uh, study. It's not that we have like a rule of thumb, like every model should be retrained every day or every month. It's something that we typically also analyze in proof of concept uh, phase, where we indeed assess uh, how frequent models have to be retrained and that's typically very um, solution and, and, and solution specific, uh, let's say, uh, this retraining. But it can go from uh, monthly retraining which in, in situations which are more stable to indeed like daily retrainings uh, as well. So um, yeah, that's quite varies and there we make a trade-off between the performance and the computational costs, uh, etc. But uh, it depends from um, forecaster to forecaster, I would have say. to overfit also, and uh, and I guess the, the, the models are on your own servers, and and then you can you can retrain them. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, and we have uh, the systems to to run like in in a proper way, like cross validations for different periods. Uh, so we we run a lot of simulations in it on our side before we launch that, and we monitor yeah performance is quite closely uh, of of our uh, models that that run in production. Uh. Okay, thank you. We had another question here in the back. And may I remind remote audience, before the question you saying, but just before you saying, may I remind the remote audience if they have a question to type it in the chat and we will ask it here in session. So you saying first, if you want to, to, to compliment. Just um, as a quick question to Pascal. Um, can we do that? Uh, uh, is this can we do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay. it's not allowed, right? <laughs> Way too dangerous. <laughs> So it was just a question following up on the recalibrations as well, that do you then 
um, so basically warm start the neural networks, I guess, yeah. just so that you restart from scratch. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think we, we try to do incremental learning. Even when we do the 24 hours of the day, we have already one network which is trained, and then we move to the next one, such that we, we are faster. Uh, you, you are entirely correct that uh, every day you have to retrain it. For instance, you know, one of the collaborators that we work with is in the southeast of the United States, so, and one of the states is Alabama, and on every Friday night they have big football game, not soccer, right? So football, re American soccer. And all the high school are putting all the lights at the same time, so that day is very different from any other day. So you have dedicated model for those days, obviously. So I think what you were saying is completely right. So you need to recalibrate as, not, as soon as you have more information. I think the difficulty is that some of the partners don't have the infrastructure to do that. And that's another thing uh, uh, to address your question. I think there is also the entire machine learning pipeline you, you have to actually tell people that this is how this has to be organized, and they, are, they don't necessarily have the skills to do that, so you have to provide that for them, in a sense, because having all this infrastructure in place and knowing exactly when you have to retrain and, 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 and you know, having the confidence that the neural net, is uh, the, machine, the differentiable program is doing the right thing at the right time is something that you need to do. So I think you, the points that, that you made were really on uh, uh, top of mind for some of, the, some of the partners that we are working with. So my question is also in the similar line of uh, the security constraint OPF. Yeah. So yeah. So in that uh, the n minus one criteria we considered was it about uh, the loss of one generator, like generator capacity, that security against loss of one generator, or was also against the lines, loss of any lines, so like where network configuration changes. So. Everything. So you can lose generators, you can lose lines. So okay, it's so it's, yeah. it's any generators, any line. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So maybe we do have time for one or two remaining questions here. Uh, a question for Raphael. Um, you said that uh, the forecasting also tackles real-time miners. What is this? Uh, yes, so that, uh, that's that's more on, on the data side. So that's uh, so we uh, typically so if you have your offline uh, model, then you typically work with historical data, etc. But uh, like models running in production, we have models that make predictions close to real time, like on a minute by minute basis, and that means that we have we need to get new input uh, every minute um, in our forecasting model as a feature. Let's say so that means that we have real-time API calls, miners that get the data somewhere, store them in our databases, so that we can uh, make a prediction uh, on, on a minute-by-minute minute basis. Uh, and that's a bit related to the whole infrastructure indeed, uh, yeah, when it comes to putting forecasting models into production. Uh. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Dirk. Uh, maybe a question inspired by what uh, Hussein said, um, but maybe everyone can respond to it. Hussein, you said you don't need a power engineer, you don't need a data engineer, but you need a blend. Um, it's already hard to find a power engineer. It's hard to find a data engineer, and you want to have uh, a hybrid, uh, so they're even more rare. Um, so how can we make sure that we get more of those special types and, and do we need to adjust our curriculum or do we need to have a, a data power system engineer training courses or something like that? I mean, of course, you you said that there is this course that you're organizing, but is that <laughs> on, on, let's say, on, on the master level or something like that, something we should focus on a bit more? Yeah, maybe just a, a small comment. I, I'm not going to define the curriculum here at uh, Kai Leuven, but just I, I confirm that that's indeed a, a very unique and a very important uh, profile in, in the industry. Uh, and that's also how we try to, to uh, position ourselves a bit as, as insights. Uh, and we see indeed a lot of uh, applications that definitely lies within the, the details. So we see that sole AI companies making some forecasts that uh, they could sometimes overlook some details um, leading to less performance. So I completely agree that we need indeed uh, more blended uh, profiles. Uh. Yeah, so 
I would also agree with Raphael because uh, what, what you said earlier about the interpretability part, that's usually quite common because we are in a quite heavily regulated industry and then like it's not possible to just throw a neural network at your problem and then expect that something is going to work out. Um, sometimes that's what happens, I guess, because we have seen instances in the past that predictions were being made for several months that did not make any sense. Um, either that's a forecast quality problem or a data quality problem. It's always unclear, but until you have proper infrastructure in place that is then set up by data science people together with energy people, these problems are going to continue happening. Um, a problem is that you usually <coughs> still have enough uh, reserves in the system for now that this doesn't really lead to bad outcomes. But I guess that's going to change and the grid operator and everyone else will have to adapt as well. Um, my solution to that would be to have more specializations um, in our curriculum, but then also go to people across the street, to the people in AI, and talk to them to have more energy transition related problems because if they have biomedical stuff and natural language processing and other types of things, why not energy? Uh, which is a very interesting problem as well. And you can see that in the type of things that Pascal presented, that yeah, these are, are huge AI related problems and why not get more people from there involved as well. I can tell you that the problem is even worse. So when I try to recruit a student, the student should know power system. He should know, uh, or she should know uh, optimization. He or she should know machine learning, and they should know how to program. So if you are a student like that, please let me know. Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to find, so I think what we do is we build teams. Uh, we try to have smart people who know two of these four things, or you know, one, one, and we believe we can teach the other ones. It's very difficult. I think the curriculum that we have, Georgia Tech is an amazing school. Right? It's top five in every engineering discipline in the US. But you don't find people who can do all these things. It's, it's just impossible. Uh, so I think we need to change the curriculum completely. We, they need to have AI courses uh, at the very beginning. In the applied math department, they need to have a lot more computational training. They don't have that. So they, they just, I, I, it's getting worse and worse because they start with Pythons. They have no idea what a real you know, system is these days. Uh, and so I think you need, you need to start very early on uh, make, uh, being very serious about AI, very serious about computation. And obviously, we want them to understand power system. You know, uh, that, that's, that, that's obvious. Uh, but they need, they need these three, and they have to good, be good at math. So they need all these things that you know, we need to train them very, very early on, instead of uh, uh, sometimes doing things that are very general but are not technical enough. So I think we, what, what I see for us in, in, at Georgia Tech is that we need, they need to have more and more technical skills. Otherwise, they're going to be phased out of the market. So I think it's, it's, really, it's really a combination of the skills that the student need. But the, 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 the interesting point is that those things are fun to do, right? So um, it's, it's really fun. Thank you. So a combination between both then. So some yeah. general course in the beginning and some special, specialized course, as you said, you're saying. No, you can see how you. I'm excited about these things. So I'm, and I'm like a very old man at this point, right? So <laughs> So I propose, if no final questions here, I propose to close this panel session and to applause again our very good speakers, excellent speakers for today.